so this is Dan York, and I'm here at uh, CES 2012 in a quiet corner of the show with uh, Joe Klein, who is the Cybersecurity Principal Architect for Kinetic. So uh, welcome, Joe. Thank you. So yesterday you were on a panel about uh, the smart grid and smart home, and, and you talked a lot about IPv6 and things, but later we were talking about DNSSEC, so I'd like to touch on that. You know, um, but first maybe, what do you do with cybersecurity? What's a cybersecurity principal architect all about? Uh, yes, um, what I do is I spend my day thinking about how to secure devices by default, and then if devices are implemented later, how to apply security features to it to ensure that they're secure and the systems aren't compromised. Uh, so let's talk a little about DNSSEC. Mm -hmm. And for folks who are, maybe don't know much about it, what does it do? What's, what's the problem is it trying to solve? The problem it's trying to solve is the ability to validate the existence and provide integrity. So, very simplified, if I make a query to www.google, if a adversary, a bad guy, basically causes some kind of uh, disruption in path or causes a problem with your system, uh, you'll never know that you're going to badguy.com. What DNSSEC does is it allows you as a, a system, a user on a system, to validate that you are truly going to google.com and not being diverted someplace else. But it also has the ability, many other abilities, um, to do validation of uh, data and also does something exist on the network or not exist. And that's real important. You mean as far as uh, does this particular site exist or does... If I see an address that's spoofed as an example, an address that okay. somebody has typed into their computer that doesn't exist and they try to come at my, my system or whatever, um, I have the ability to query the DNS servers and say does this server that they're claiming to be truly who they are? So you have a you know, do you really exist, do you not exist? And that's real important. Uh, right now in the IPv4 infrastructure, we really have a, a willy-nilly, you know, we hope that we get to where we're supposed to get, and we hope that the packets aren't corrupted in, in path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, I mean, but obviously one question about DNSSEC is, you know, if I'm going to my bank's website or something, obviously we need to secure that, but, but I've got SSL certificates, I've got EV SSL certificates. Y you know, why is that not good enough? Uh, number one, we've seen compromises of many of the certificate servers, uh, the people that actually hand out those certificates. Uh, when those are compromised, you have no way of being told that those were compromised. It takes time, it takes you know a day if you patch directly, or it could take weeks in some cases. So if you're on a laptop trying to go to your bank, again, somebody can divert that traffic um, to do validation. With IPv4, we have the ability, again, to reach out and validate. Um, that is truly where the, the destination I'm trying to get to. With DNSSEC? Yes, you know, it's on almost top. like an evil um, operator. If I pick up the phone and there was an evil operator uh -huh. that could randomly answer the phone and give you the wrong phone number, uh -huh. and then hang up, but you never knew when that was going to happen. Um, that's essentially the problem that DNSSEC um, deals with. And this actually impacts phishing, this impacts spam, uh, this impacts many other things. So it doesn't necessarily replace SSL, but it's kind of an adjunct or an additional layer of defense. Yes, yes. big so, improvement. Yeah, so you can be able to ensure that the domain to which you're connecting is correct, right. and then you would have the secondary level of the SSL certificate ensuring again that, you, that your connection is encrypted, right. really, because the NSSEC does not do encryption, right? It does not do encryption, although it does have a feature to be able to pro provide a public key so that you can validate when you talk to that web server, that's truly the web server you're going to, again, the evil operator mm -hmm. uh, problem, if you want to call it that. Well, so, you know, beyond website security, you know, what else can DNSSEC be used for? Uh, um, within the smart grid environment or within a... Which, actually, let's pause for a second. What is the smart grid environment? Some uh, people watching may not know okay. what that is. Uh, the smart grid is a rethink of how we transmit power and to be able to provide more efficient power distribution, to be able like to... electrical power. Electrical power, right. So that we can better control the grid itself. But in addition to that, to be able to have more efficient homes, 
um, as part of this whole process to be able to use telecommunications, you know, network technologies to be able to reach in and say, you know, you've got your coffee pot on and it's been on for a day and you may want to turn it off, you know, it's using lots of power. So the ability to, for the homeowner to then be able to better control their power utilization and also the, the capabilities of the carriers, the, the electrical grid to be able to control how much power they have to generate. Because unlike um, email, which stacks up in a box, um, electricity is instantly gone. It's produced and either used or it's gone. Hmm. So, yeah, that's true. So yeah. this provides a better capability um, to control how much power needs to be generated. So we talk about that sometimes in the press. We see that as uh, talking about Internet of Things or yes. the sensor networks or yes. things like that. So it's sort of all that. So you're saying DNA, what role does DNSSEC play in that? Uh, DNSSEC um, allows the sensor, once it um, authorizes itself to the local network, Mm -hmm. The DNSSEC on, as an example, your network, uh, if that sensor were to want to communicate with me, I could validate that that was not only authorized on your network, but also be able to get a sort of public key certificate so I could securely communicate with that particular item on your network. So again, the whole evil, um, the whole evil operator issue. Is, uh, is mitigated pretty dramatically that way. Also, um, there's one problem with it. Right now with IPv4, um, there's a limitation on who you're connecting to. You don't know who's behind a firewall or behind a NAT. Sure. With IPv6, because we're having an end-to-end -end connection, we can, with, along with DNSSEC, we're allowed to be able to reach right into that device and be able to authenticate to that device directly, but also um, validate that that is authorized on your network, that you, know, you recognize on the network so that I can communicate it, uh, to it securely. So, so you would use DNSSEC to be able to determine that that device was in fact, you know, had a valid DNS record, the yes. chain of trust up to the top, et cetera. Yes. And, and, but now, and, it, and I guess it could use DNSSEC to do a reverse you know, check on you to be sure that you were in fact coming from the correct location. Yes, unlike SSL that we use today, mm -hmm. typically the first part of the process is you receive a secure tunnel to them mm -hmm. and then you typically type a password or some kind of code in and log into the system. Um, with this, what this would allow us to, is to create a bi-directional trust mm -hmm. that in addition to a password, would be a very strong trust. The current SSL mechanism is a very weak trust with the current DNS infrastructure. That's true, unless you go to mutually mutual certificates, mutual et certificates, and yeah. I don't know of many organizations, banking or whatever, that's moved to into that environment because it's very costly to them to distribute this. This makes the distribution very inexpensive of a bi-directional trust relationship and Be also the crypto for the two. Because we're distributing the keys through DNS. Exactly. So DNS is effectively a public key infrastructure. Yes, but the nice thing about it is you sign your own key, you generate your own keys for your own devices, so therefore you don't have to buy some additional expensive upstream keys. You can reference the DNS infrastructure to generate, again, custom keys for your own infrastructure. Hmm. So if you choose that you want little tiny keys with minimal security and then you want very large keys, the, the price would basically be set up a, a certificate server or PKI for yourself and generate Right, so keys. you're in control of the keys and you're in, exactly. in, in all of that and you're uploading it into DNS or, or you or your registrar or whoever you're working with, your exactly. DNS hosting provider. Is exactly, say, so it's a, it's a real, it really civilizes the internet Mm -hmm. because now we can truly have a trusted... Uh, there was an old uh, cartoon uh, a while back uh, that had a dog <laughs> typing on the internet. Way back, and New Yorker. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I still have what, that in my slides. I, I did too, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the comment to the bo uh, on the bottom is... Um, uh, you no know, one on the internet no knows your dog. No one your dog. You know? <laughs> so because of that, um, we have this trust issue. Yeah. Um, DNSSEC really improves that trust. The, again, the problem with it is with IPv4, we have to trust that our local network's not compromised and our 
upstream provider that NATS or whatever isn't compromised. And then on the other side, that those other items on the other side behind their firewall aren't compromised. Again, with IP6 and with end-to-end -end connection with the DNSSEC, we have a very strong trust mm -hmm. and very strong crypto that could be mm -hmm. available for you. Now, um, yeah, you mentioned uh, Internet of Things. Uh, what else could you do with uh, with DNSSEC? What other kinds of things can you do with it? Oh, um, there is a new specification to offer the ability to send XML configurations. What that would do is if I needed to communicate with someone or another system and I didn't know what additional protocols at the application levels I needed, okay. this would allow me to provide that XML framework of how to communicate with um, that other endpoint. What this becomes very valuable is now we can create generalized applications that can bring in that XML, configure themselves for how it communicates. You know, today it's name, address, telephone number, maybe tomorrow it's uh, name, home address, telephone number as an example for sure. a database. This would allow the setup time to be a lot faster and also coming from a trusted source instead of, um, as an example, if we do business together and you make a change to your application and it shifts all the characters to the right, 12 characters, and uh -huh. my database can't see it, this allows us to share that information okay. and uh, allow that information to be, once you modify your server application, my client is actually not impacted. Okay, so it's a big benefit. All right. I could see that, but I'm immediately sitting here getting these danger, danger warning signs in my brain when you start talking about stuffing big blocks of XML into DNS. Won't this impact the like, size issues of, of DNS queries? I mean, they're typically tiny. Exactly, but we've moved from a UDP packet um, for, IP, uh, for oh, yeah. DNS, yeah. and now we've moved to a TCP packet. Okay. Um, we're seeing a lot more data being shoved into it, not only for IPv6 addresses, but also other classes of data. So this is just kind of a logical place. There is discussions about <laughs> reducing the size down to so many, you know, Well, sure, K, but because I, I stick a whole bunch of XML, and, and I like this in one sense, because you're right, you can securely distribute the configuration information. But so, But will that not... I mean, will that not have an impact on network performance? It may have performance uh, hits on the DNS lookups. Uh huh. That's that should have an impact. But on the other side, as an example, how if I had that feature and I had a phone which only has a very small amount of data, mm -hmm. so I could authenticate to the phone, and I could have the features for that phone right. be, be reconfigured based on the security policy, the capability policy. Maybe I have a mobile phone that um, I connect securely in via DNSSEC, via IP6, I can pull specific security policies across and have those applied as I'm communicating with the system. So there's, there's, there's upsides and downsides to this idea, mm -hmm. um, but DNS and DNSSEC um, is a very strong play. Now you mentioned IP phones and, and we were talking yesterday, there's a, there's a VoIP angle on this too, right? Yes. And how can it be? How can DNSSEC work with VoIP? Oh, um, there's a feature within the DNS uh, DNS feature that allows us to register telephone numbers and other types of information. The DNSSEC allows us to create the bi-directional trust to ensure that that is the switchboard I'm trying to switching system I'm trying to talk yeah. to, and that is an authorized phone to be able to connect to my sure. network. Once that's created. We've seen a lot of proprietary encryption protocols uh, being used with this. And again, I'm going to go back to IPv6. This allows both systems, once they have a trust level, to be able to use pre-shared certificates, switch those certificates back and forth, and now we're using standard IPsec to do a voice call. So now instead of the multiple different voice protocols that we have, secure this or secure that, um, it kind of eliminates that and takes that whole complexity out of the um, layer. The yeah, and, yes. and also I know that in the in the SIP world, we've always been. You know, if I initiate a SIP connection to your, you know, uh, to your side, and I want to, mm -hmm. you know, do it directly on your address, I'm doing a lookup in a, in, uh, in DNS for your the SRV record for your IPPBX or something like this. And this 
now allows me to sign that so I can be very sure that I'm actually getting to the right place. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, what, uh, what's kind of next for DNSSEC? You know, I know people are working on Dane, they're working on all sorts of different types of things. What, what, what do you see kind of the neat things coming up with it? Um, Beyond the XML config stuff. The XML is actually <laughs> more interesting to load for applications. And yeah. that's where the, the world exists today is the cool applications that are above the network protocol yeah. layer. But also, again, having that trust. Um, I really see the DNS sec is going to be critical for the smart grid. Mm. I see it's going to be critical for the systems. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of the next-gen um, uh, automobile systems. Um, it's the ability for automobiles to uh, communicate to other automobiles, which will be using Wi-Fi type protocol. And we also have... Let's hope that's secured. We have cars, <laughs> exactly. That we have cars that will be communicating with the highway and the highway communicating with the cars. So we have this wireless interaction taking place uh -huh. that's going to require trusting as a lot, I, a lot <laughs> as we go past specific areas. And without DNSSEC to support that feature, we have, again, the operator in the middle. Yeah. The issue that can occur instantly and cause maybe damage or loss of life because of maybe a decision that's not, not made. And we're seeing DNSSEC applied many other places. Now, I mean, this all sounds great. It's been around, DNSSEC has been in development for a ten good number years. of years, 10 years now. Yeah. So uh, what, what are the barriers? What, why isn't it just widely adopted yet? Hmm. Um, it's interesting. The root servers um, for .com were just recently signed for the governments. Many governments have already signed it. We have probably, at this point, approximately 40% of the DNS infrastructure signed. At the um, top level. At yeah, the top right, level. Which then carries down. The, the next challenge is the next level down. A lot of organizations don't justify uh, security as a feature <laughs> in their products or their services. So a lot of times it won't be implemented. We've noticed that the government has edicts to implement DNSSEC within the .gov and the .mil domain. But we don't see that in the .com domain. We don't see that. Right any place else and therefore we're still going to have a wild west of the internet until this infrastructure is implemented. I mean with IPv6 and DNSSEC we end up with a more civilized environment where we can establish real trusts instead of artificial trusts. You know, what, what are some of the lessons we've learned for DNSSEC? Some of the lessons learned is uh, generating uh, DNSSEC has two different features you can use. You can create very long keys. Mm -hmm. The problem with the long keys is it's uh, depending on the size of the key. Um, the key can actually use a lot of processing power every time it has to regenerate keys. That becomes a real problem. Uh, the second thing is having the key generation too often. Um, one organization was trying to do a key regeneration once a day. And that once a day was causing, you know, speed performance problems, and also there were points where they were disconnected from their customers because of all this churning of, of authentication systems. Well, thanks for your time, Joe. And um, where can people find out about you? Uh, do you want to pitch? Uh, you know, if you just do a search on Google or anything else, type Joe Klein IPv6, and you'll end up not only at my site but other videos discussing security considerations when implementing different technologies, uh, recommendations for implementing DNSSEC, rec for IPv6, routing infrastructures. Um, I've done, I'm, uh, I can be found. Cool. All right. Well, Thank thanks. You. Thanks for your time.